I debated a lot about telling this story because it is fascinating. It gets so crazy. I think people need to be reminded, don't do this, okay? Just don't. No. Well, hello, my silky friends. If you're new to this channel, I'm Lily, and this is Silky Southern Tea, where we tell vintage stories, a little bit of murder, a little bit of woo-woo ghost stories, and mostly just stories that we feel need to be told. So, that's what I'm doing today. Today's tea is lemon ginger, because this one, it is bitter. It's just bitter, the whole thing but you gotta drink something. And we're back today with the very garish hat. Do you see, do you see this? It's got like sequins. It's not like something I would actually wear. Although it's, it's got a really cute cut and a really cute feather. But yeah, today's story, it's, it's like a three ring circus. So this story takes place in 1888 and it is sometimes known as the Hawes Horror or the Hawes Murder Trial. This time we're gonna actually start with the discovery of an unknown body. So it was December 4th, 1888, and you had two teenage boys out on East Lake in their boat, and they see what they think is a doll in the water. It's something, and they don't know what it is, so they go over there to it. Well, when they try to start scooping it out of the water, they realize it is the body of a little girl. So they immediately leave the body there and go call the police. That is about the only sensible thing that happens in this whole story. So the police get there, they drag the body out, and by this time, you know, it's gathering a crowd, and they have this little girl's body out here, and she looks small, they're guessing somewhere around nine years old-ish. She's dressed nicely. They can't really figure out if it's just like an accidental drowning, but where are the parents? Is anybody missing this child? It would seem that nobody could identify her. She was a beautiful girl with light brown hair and big blue eyes, and they couldn't figure out why no one had informed the police. So what they did is they took her to the funeral parlor. People started coming from all over Birmingham trying to get a look at her and see if they could identify her, and no, they couldn't. Well, even the schools let out early so the kids could go and see the dead body. Y'all go look at a dead person, see if you know them. I mean, that's horrible. Today, that would never happen. She laid out there for about a day, a day and a half, until the local butcher came just to look and see if he might possibly know. And lo and behold, he recognized her as May Hawes, the daughter of Richard and Emma Hawes. Well, at least now they know who she was. So we have to back up a little bit to the marriage of Richard and Emma Hawes. Now, you know, she was a nice looking young woman. He was a nice looking guy. He was an engineer for the Georgia Pacific Railroad. It seemed like it was gonna be a great life. Well, what actually happened is they got married in Atlanta, started having marital problems, moved to Montgomery and then to Birmingham where he would conduct the train from Birmingham to Columbus, Mississippi. So that meant he was gone a lot. And soon enough, kids started coming along. And there was a lot of accusations of infidelity on both sides. She also took to drinking. I mean, she was left alone with the kids. I don't know. I don't know her situation. But, you know, she was unhappy. And he was apparently unhappy as well. Let's go back now to the death of May Hawes. Once they realized who she was, they started looking for her parents. So they immediately go to the house. And there they find things kind of in disarray and nobody home. The door's unlocked. There's no mama. There's no brother and sister. And the daddy, who knows where he's at? They're just all gone. Well, as they're trying to decide what on earth happened to these people because he was such a big deal at georgia pacific and well known a telegram came to the birmingham paper with a great announcement saying that richard hawes was married yeah he 
had just gotten married. Okay, but, uh, and he married a Miss May Story. Somebody right here. Now, some people said that they didn't think he was actually married to Emma, that they were divorced. Oh, but no, there is no proof of that. So unbeknownst to him and his new bride, who are just dressed to the nines, they were going to be passing through Birmingham on this train. So the police didn't have to do anything. They just sat and waited for the train to get into the Birmingham station. Well, when it did, the first thing they did was arrest Richard Halls. Much to the surprise of his wife, May, who had no idea. He had told her that he was divorced and he had one son, Willie, who lived in Atlanta. The police go and arrest Mr. Hawes right off the train in his wedding suit. And they're like, we're arresting you for the murder of your child. Well, he doesn't even ask which child. He doesn't really say anything. He doesn't act shocked. He doesn't act surprised. He's just like, whatever. And so they take him to jail. Well, he said that he and Emma got divorced and she was taking the kids and she just left. So he decided he was going to marry May Story and that's why he went to Columbus, Mississippi. Now they did check out relatives in Atlanta because that's where he said his son was staying. Now remember, his new wife only knew about one child. She didn't know about the two daughters, May and Irene. They did find out that Willie was indeed staying with relatives. But where was Emma and Irene? Little May's body had been found. Everybody else is missing. Richard Hawes vehemently denied having anything to do with that. But his story was just a little bit thin. When his new wife found out about all the lies had been telling, she immediately filed for divorce. I mean, this was ridiculous. So he writes her a letter saying, oh honey, I'm so sorry. Well, it's a little bit too late, buddy. So while he's wasting away in jail, the public outcry is so great. They're like, where? Where are Emma and Irene? Well, since May's body was found in the lake, they decided to start looking for the rest of them. They did start combing around the shoreline and on down in East Lake, they did find Emma's body and it had been weighted down with a railroad tie. Well, that was pretty heavy in itself. Plus Emma, they got to thinking, okay, whoever did this probably had some help. It was a little much for one person. So now they definitely said, okay, Richard, we know you murdered your wife. Of course, he was still claiming his innocence. He didn't know anything about it. He had just left to marry his new love. Whatever. Yeah, we believe you. They still had a missing child. They could account for everyone except Irene, who was about four years old, four to six, somewhere around in there. The public outcry was so great. They said, we want you to drain this lake. We want to find her body because they were convinced she was there. So they drained the lake, and what do you think they found? They found Irene, weighted down just like Emma with a railroad tie. Now remember, May wasn't weighed down because she's the one that floated to the top. So now with all the evidence against him, yeah, he pretty much confessed, I mean. But what he did say, he said he was responsible, but he didn't actually do it. He said he hired a guy named John Wiley to actually kill Emma and the other kids, and he really didn't mean to kill May. That was not part of the plan. He had sent Willie off to Atlanta, and he was going to spare May, except somehow or other, in all of his planning, she caught wind of what he was going to do, and she was a witness to part of the murder plan. And so he realized he had to do away with her as well. What he did is he got her intoxicated, took her down for a walk to East Lake, and there he strangled and drowned her. And then, I guess, just left her. Gets on a train, goes to Columbus, Mississippi, and gets married. Because that's what you do when you commit murder. I find this so disturbing because there was no need in any of this. I mean, if he was unhappy with his family and he didn't want them anymore, he could have just divorced them. 
it doesn't seem to me that Emma would have minded that much either, as it said that she probably had a lot of lovers as well as he did, being gone all the time and drinking, yeah, whatever. You didn't have to kill your whole family. So here comes the trouble because, you know, these are the days where they like to lynch people. So here comes a crowd of about 1,500 people. They just want to string him up. They don't want a fair trial. I mean, this tragedy hit too close to home. The governor sent reinforcements in, but it was just a big fat mess. Tensions got heated. The sheriff was trying to keep the people out. If it wasn't just the thugs that were coming, it was, you know, people like U.S. Marshals. It was the postmaster, for goodness sake. All showing up saying, we want Richard Hall's hide. So there was a standoff, and it resulted in the last thing that Birmingham ever wanted to be known for, and that was a massacre. Now, Birmingham had not been settled all that long, and they were trying to portray themselves as a up-and-coming New South city, you know, progressive and all those things. You know, you had some crooks, you had some ladies of the evening, you had some scammers, you had some, you know, fugitives, as well as people just trying to build a new city. There was, however, a good bit of lawlessness. Without wanting any violence, Birmingham is at a standoff. It is unclear who shot first, but witnesses say that they heard a shot coming from the top of the building, which would indicate that maybe it was an officer that, you know, had been staked out in various places. I don't know. But what happened is gunfire erupted. That lasted for a few minutes, and the end result was that 11 people lay dead. One of them being the Birmingham Postmaster. There was also a U.S. Marshal from Gaston who wasn't on duty. He had just come to see a lynching, if there was going to be one. He's like, I didn't mean for this to happen. I didn't know I'd be involved. Well, honey, mind your business. Quit lynching people. I know what to tell you. So now, what the last thing Birmingham wanted was news about this. But of course, it made national news because it was a big, big deal. So it was like a three-ring circus. They decided to go ahead with the trial. And they also felt like he did not do this alone because it just required too much effort and the moving of bodies and whatnot. But then it gets really crazy. On April 1st, of 1889, there is a story in the Birmingham News. The report said that the sheriff and the deputies were overtaken by another crowd demanding to lynch him, and that in the process, Richard Hawes ended up getting loose and he was gone. Yeah, he had fled. Well, as it turned out, none of that was true. That was the newspaper making an April Fool's joke. Seriously? you got to be kidding me. A newspaper reporting this story, getting everybody all upset all over again. And it's just an April Fool's joke. Can you imagine the lawsuits that would be done today with such a thing? So the trial does begin. Well, the evidence was just too strong. Another train conductor in Birmingham actually recognized Richard Hawes and May Hawes the night that they got off the train at Eastlake and they were gone for about an hour and then he gets back on the train by himself. That was some damning evidence as well as, well, everything. Your whole family is drowned and cut up and whatever. Who else they gonna blame? And to make it all worse, he really didn't seem to be that sorry. All he did was try to be a little bit charming, get his new wife back and tell her he's sorry, try to blame it on everybody else. It was John Wiley. Well, er eventually, John Wiley was tried for his involvement with the death of Emma and May and Irene, but that was dropped because there was no evidence to link him. Richard Hawes was quickly found guilty, as you can imagine. Nobody else had a motive, and clearly he didn't have much sense to turn around and get married the next day after he murdered his wife. But now here's where it gets interesting. You know, Richard had been all dressed up for his wedding when he got arrested, but he had some new satin slippers on for his hanging. 
But when he came out, he didn't look like he was sorry. He didn't apologize. He just came out looking all dapper. He had a geranium in his little lapel, and he was wearing brand new clothes. This local store had donated the outfit and the shoes to him to promote business. Yeah, that was their marketing strategy. There were a few very unusual things about his hanging, one being the clothes that he was wearing, um, Two being the fact that one of the jurors that had convicted him was actually in the scaffold building business. And he was the one who built the scaffold <laughs> that Richard Halls hung on. Also, the sheriff had kind of lost his job during that whole Birmingham massacre fiasco. But by the time that Mr. Halls was hung, he was back in some kind of position. And he was the one that actually pulled the lever. Just hours before his hanging, Richard wrote a letter to his brother, and he never took responsibility. What he said was that all of his troubles came from whiskey and wanton women. Sounds like a narcissist to me. His second wife just kind of disappeared, went under the radar. It is believed that she married again, and um, lived a normal life afterwards. And you, you can't help but kind of feel sorry for her. I mean, she had no idea. It is mind-boggling to me how someone could ruin so many lives over a situation he could easily have gotten out of. Even back in that day, yes, there would have been some shunning, a little bit of talk. But honey, not anything like what he caused. And then the Birmingham Massacre, 11 people dead just because of you and your nonsense. Newspapers, making up wild stories, people giving you clothes to advertise the death suits. Like what? They thought people were going to just, you know, say, oh, I want to die in that. Seriously? No. <laughs> I don't know. What is wrong with people? Today, that lake where Irene and Emma Haas' bodies were found is now being covered back up. It is now a golf course. But over on East Lake Park, there is still part of a lake, and that is where May Haas' body was found originally. Over the years, actually starting in 1889, people started seeing this little girl along the edge of the river, and she suspiciously looks a lot like May Haas. So this sighting has gone on and on throughout the last hundred years. And East Lake does do a remembrance for May Haas. Every Halloween they set little jack-o'-lanterns out on the walkway and piers around the lake just to light her trail. May Haas is also known as the Mermaid of East Lake. It's kind of sweet. Really, really tragic. So that's a little bit of a murder, a little bit of a ghost story. We're heading into spooky season, so um, how did you like that story? I'd like to know. I found it fascinating, the, the whole fiasco, the three-ring circus that it was. I mean, to finish it off, William Haas was raised in Atlanta by his relatives. You cannot find him. You cannot find any descendants. You can't find anything. So the belief is is that he changed his name completely to get away from his infamous parents and um, the whole situation. So we don't really know. If anybody knows, uh, I would love to hear it. And comment below if you know a story or you've heard a story that you think would be interesting, let me know. And let me ask you this. What kind of stories interest you the most? Are they the murders? Are they the mysteries? Are they the ghost stories? I'd like to kind of know what direction that you're interested in. Okay, I'm going to call it a day because I have talked too much. And this hat is getting really hot. <sighs> Hope you had a great holiday. I will see you in the next video. And remember to always stay silky. Uh -huh.